Hello and welcome to The Two View, the cutting edge educational show for PAs and nurse practitioners in emergency medicine and urgent care. And we are live in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's so great to be face to face with everybody here. My name is Mike Sharma. I am a practicing emergency medicine and urgent care PA in the Dallas, Texas area and an adjunct professor of PA studies. With me as always is Martha Roberts. Hello everyone, I'm Martha Roberts. I'm a nurse practitioner and I practice in Northern California. And I am the second view. Along with me is our third view, our oblique view, Chip Lang. Wait, no, 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 we gave... No, 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 I got a special one. Yes. Yes. Oh. What's your view, Chip? The sunrise. <gasps> we gave him the sunrise. Chip is, as always, the sunrise view. So thanks for being here, Chip. Chip, tell about yourself a little bit. So uh, my name is Chip Lang, I'm an emergency medicine PA that practices in rural Missouri. And because I'm a glutton for punishment, I do fire EMS. And I've done that for about 15 years. And uh, I've been a PA for 10 years now, so. Chip, do you, you know, emergency medicine is so broad. Do you have any particular areas of emergency medicine in which you like mm. to concentrate in? No, like something about like point of care ultrasound, I think. Like, so uh, I, I, I do POCUS, which uh, for, for POCUS, I, I also have my own ultrasound education company called Practical POCUS. And uh, with Practical POCUS, we go all over the country, but we have a grant through the state of Missouri right now. So if you live and or work in the state of Missouri, you can take our classes literally for free. Like there's no, no gimmicks or anything like that. You just sign up and take a class. Uh, even if you don't live in the state of Missouri, we've been able to kind of reduce our rates with this going on just because of, of, of stuff. So uh, if even if you don't live in the state of Missouri, take our classes and you can do them both online and in person, uh, just like the boot camp. Now, I'm sorry, it's been, today is the day that you have literally been practicing for 10 years as a PA, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so yesterday I graduated 10 years ago and uh, uh, I, I jumped on my boards as quickly as they let me, which is like January, I don't know, like second or something like that. And, uh, and then passed first time, woohoo, and have been doing it since then. The profession is better for it. Yes, real happy. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, Vegas goes for yet. it all year, and Christmas is no exception. As we record this, my wife Monica is on her way here. We're looking forward to taking in the, the sights and sounds of Vegas and hopefully some tastes of the season as well. Martha, you spent a lot of time in this town, going back to probably when you were a teenager. Um, do you have any special Christmas in Vegas recommendations? Actually, I would definitely say go off the strip a little bit, and if you just venture off, you save yourself a couple hundred bucks. Food shows. There's a great part of old Vegas with some really cool old signs. Um, I also really just like to utilize the hotel. I didn't do that before. Mm. And so utilizing the hotel you're in is, is really great. I have absolutely no financial gain. I get no free spa treatment, but I would say like, why not? Like I used the gym this morning oh. on my morning off, which was great. So yeah, just, you know, just kind of give yourself a, a gift of nothing. Especially you know? at Caesars, you don't have to leave Caesars. You can eat a yeah. different thing every meal of every day you're here and, yep. and, and be, you know, well treated. Yep, I definitely. I, I recommend the buffet. I, I literally have not left the building. The, tonight when we go to the, the Sphere, the Globe, whatever the hell it is, um, <laughs> like, that will be the first time of leaving this building since being here. So, because, not, not, not to my choice, I realize that sounds terrible when I say that, <laughs> like... <laughs> We, there's we'll so much to do in here. We'll unlock your shackle for tonight, Chip, and then you can go out here and experience the world. Okay. Uh, well, Chip, you are sadly stag on this trip. Your wife could not make it here. Uh, when you get home, do you have any particular traditions you're waiting on as far as Christmas or holidays for your family? Yeah, so we, we, have, uh, we have two little girls, and uh, you know we, we both come in, my, my wife and I both come in with our, our family traditions from before, but now we have kind of new stuff of ours, which includes making ornaments, which are highly breakable. Um, so the, the, we, we've evolved our ornaments over the years of trying to create them, but they <laughs> end up going bad. So we tried to uh, do gingerbread houses this year, which uh, was fun because uh, I get to pull out the engineering side of me. And uh, they are still standing despite what the kids have done to it. Uh, but, you know, we, we do stuff like that. And then um, we usually do like one... Uh, one Christmas gift uh, on Christmas Eve, and I'm mm. being evil like my parents, and I'm always using DJs. So huh? yeah, I learned that one from them. Uh, but but anyway, the uh, uh, and then the other thing is we've we've done like a Lego advent calendar. Yeah, so they get to play with that too. So it's it's nice because it helps keep them out of the places where the gifts are, and hopefully like you know. I want not, a Lego advent something. calendar. It is awesome. You can buy one for yourself. Like, yeah, well. You know, they're, they're on sale right now because, you know, we're halfway through we're already. 50% <laughs> off advent calendars. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, speaking of traditions, <laughs> we are bringing a tradition back here for 2024. It is the Advanced Emergency Medicine Boot Camp. We are going to be live in July here back in Las Vegas. It is July 10th through 12th, so never too early to ask off from work. July 10th through 12th with a pre-conference day for EKG and Im imaging on the 9th. So that's happening here. Um, and uh, lots of topics that are just, you, you know, we, we take the original emergency medicine boot camp and we expand and we go deeper on some of these topics because, you know, we just got done with the panel discussion, which you're going to hear actually at the end of our podcast. But um, we could have kept going for another half an hour, at least another half Easily. an hour, you know, if not an hour or whatever else. But we, we, we just could not do that. Okay. So, so, um, yeah. The time is the advanced boot camp to do those sort of things, okay? Well, um, that's going to be, uh, you know, right now, though, what we're going to do is this. Uh, actually, you know what? You, you talk about what we're going to do first. Yeah, do so we're going to do things a little bit differently for this podcast. Uh, usually we have several sections in which we cover, but we're going to cover two medical legal cases, uh, very interesting cases. They involve nurse practitioners and PAs directly. As you know, we're the podcast, we're the only podcast, I believe, that covers specifically NP and PA cases together. We like to mix things up together um, and then talk about how we incorporate some of these other physician problems that relate to maybe some of our problems. We're going to then do our giveaway like we always do, and we're giving away one free course for the Center for Medical Education. And we're going to be, you know... Um, Picking that at uh, random? Is that it? No, we have a trivia question. It's gettable. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. Yeah, it's gettable. Because last time nobody got the answer, and then I forgot what we were going to do. So. No, we have somebody, actually. Somebody, somebody rang in very late, and we have a, a winner. Oh, we, okay. okay. Oh, you good. mean for here? Yeah. And we gave it away still? Okay. Anyways. All right, well, we'll figure it out. But we got this. Stay yeah, tuned. Yeah, yeah. We'll fix it in post. Anyways, um, and then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to, again, ha put that panel discussion in. Probably my favorite talks of boot camp are these panel discussions where mm -hmm. you're hearing people kind of like getting into the squared circle and kind of duking it out about yeah. different perspectives in emergency medicine and where they differ and where they are similar. Let's go ahead and dive into the first case here. And I have to call this, it's all in your head. What I'd like to do is this, mix it up a little bit here. When you're in the audience, you see something that the medical team, let's say there was an opportunity for improvement. Just go ahead and raise your hand. If you see something where it's like, oh, that's interesting, you know, that could have been done better. Go ahead and raise your hand. I'm just so curious to see what you guys are thinking. And that's the way you can kind of be like critically appraising these cases along with us here. So um, I'll begin. This was a case of Mr. W who was hit by a car. Like as a pedestrian, he was hit by a car, head and body injuries, understandably. Him and his companion went to the hospital, to the ER and said, he was hit by a car and he needs medical attention. And this person apparently had visible head injury. It's bad when you can look and go, oh, that's, that's got a head injury. Okay, it's the, 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 those are the easy ones. Okay. All right, so after registration, Mr. W was directed inside the hospital and told to wait. Sounds pretty reasonable. Because of COVID-19, he sat alone in the waiting room, unobserved, and fell asleep. No issues so far, anybody? No, I saw, I saw a hand. Oh, okay, I, saw a hand. I see right. two hands. Fell asleep, gotcha. huh? More hands. All hands. All hands on deck. <laughs> Woke up and went to the desk to tell them that he needed help. And five hours after first arriving at the ED is when that happened. Okay. All right. So, All right, so a hospital employee told that Mr. W that since he hadn't responded, he would have to go outside and re-register in order to be seen. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a problem. Like, oh, no, no, don't like that. Okay. Now, to be to be fair, I mean, it, and it's vague enough in this case. Was it one of those that they they assumed he left without being seen, and maybe mm -hmm. he was completely out of the system? But it doesn't really say that one way or the other. Uh, but Mr. W became upset and reiterated that he'd been hit by a car, had a severe headache, and needed attention. And so he's told by the hospital staff that he had to start the process again. Yeah, People are raising two hands at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I think I would, Mr. W became <laughs> agitated and was asked to leave the ED. Security had to haul him out of the hospital. He was later diagnosed with a concussion and a brain contusion by physicians at another hospital. So that's not great. Oh, so Mr. W claimed that he was entitled to summary judgment on his EMTALA claim because the hospital had failed to screen him for an emergency condition and failed to stabilize him. 
Do you want to just um, That's quick basic. aside? So, like EMTALA, do you want to talk about what the hospital is required to do here as far as EMTALA? What does that mean? EMTALA? Patient needs to do a physical examination. It may be brief, and it needs to be documented somewhere, and it, it's it's a requirement. You can't say no. This is a federally mandated yeah. law. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. Can we also talk about what a summary judgment is? We can get there in a second. Oh, okay. So, who has to do an EMTALA? Who has to do an a medical screening exam. Is there any sort of requirement there, do you think? It can't be a nurse, okay? Oh, really? It, it, well, depending on the state. Okay, fair, fair. But where I am, it needs to be a nurse practitioner, PA, or physician. So know your, your local. I mean, people here are probably not making those decisions as far as who is doing an MSC, but a triage assessment by a triage nurse is not adequate to be a medical screening an exam. An MSC by a nurse is not a medical screening exam, period. Okay. It's not. Where I am. Is there anybody else where that is? No, I think by federal law it is yeah. PA and P physician are the only oh, ones yeah. who can do the MSE. For some reason I yeah. thought that appropriately trained nurses could do, anyways, but, but uh, well, I have no evidence behind that. Technically NPs are nurses, but well, I, I we mean, are um, also MPs. Yeah. So we just had this conversation. That's why I'm, I'm like, this is the way it is. <laughs> like we, we were like, can the nurses? No, no, they cannot do it. Okay, all right. Okay, Chip, summary judgment, go. So summary judgment is basically like a trial on paper. So this is something that you're, you're basically going to the judge to say that this is so clear, so egregious. I have met uh, the requirements for this type of case that we don't need to actually have a trial by uh, like a bench trial with a judge or a jury trial. Um, that we can simply make this decision based on the facts of the case that's presented on the paper. Uh, so summary judgment, like when judges do pick that up, means you really screwed up. Yeah. So I think it's to you, Chip, as far oh, as yeah, the screening yeah, sorry. aspect. Sorry. So, uh, so, so with the screening, the court held that it was undisputed that Mr. W. did not receive a medical screening, although the ED had the capacity to do so. And then the hospital asserted that the reason why Mr. W. wasn't seen was because his name was taken out of the system, which is kind of what, what, what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, and again, with, uh, when it says that the court held that it was undisputed, that's where that whole su summary judgment part comes in. It's like saying, like, nope, this, this met the, the standard for what we're looking for there. It was such a, an egregious... Yeah, such know, an egregious, such an obvious thing that the, the, the defendant can't really say that didn't happen. This is another part of EMTALA is if you find or suspect a medical emergency, you have to stabilize that a medical emergency. Okay, so court also found it was undisputed that Mr. W. Um, had told the hospital there was some sort of emergency condition that was likely going on, and there was a staff person who had checked in. Mr. W. noted the injuries and did not alert this, you know, Quite a serious mechanism of injury, okay? Pedestrian versus motor vehicle, that's a pretty big deal. Um, but no, no provider apparently was alerted as far as like, yo, you gotta see this person right now. In many systems, that's a level one or at least a level two trauma. So yeah. I mean, like th this is something that probably should have gotten that given. Again, just like we like talked about just earlier, you, you know, you don't know what surrounding it and you know things were going on for why he didn't get to go back right away, or, or at least in a more timely fashion. But yeah, that's that's not. Good. <laughs> we also haven't talked about the fact that security, like a school, yeah. like security, security. It, it's so hard. Like it's it's very easy because we know the outcome of the case. Th there is an opportunity for us to go. Well, clearly this shouldn't have happened, and clearly that shouldn't have happened. We are leaving a ton out of this case, not intentionally, just because it was not disclosed to this case. So, um, like, I, my knee jerk reaction is like, wow, they really screwed the pooch on this one, but. Who knows what was happening? I mean, like it says COVID-19 restrictions. So like, were they in the middle of COVID? What was going on there? How overrun was this hospital? Like, I don't know. You know, a lot could have been going on there. Well, also, uh, I don't, do we have an additional slide here? This is it, yeah. yeah. So the court granted Mr. W's motion and ordered that the parties appear before a magistrate judge and the settlement proceedings regarding the damages and providing an EMTALA violation does not require that much. A patient with an emergency situation must be screened and then provided with stabilizing treatment if necessary. And uh, sorry, if, if I can, again, just to kind of explain just some of the, the legalese here. So what they're talking about it, it also is that, so the summary judgment was successful, like judge agrees, like it's obvious, 
there's damages. So in that case, like your case is kind of left to in, in, in some instances where you might be allowed to argue damages. Um, and that's what you'll see in some of these like popular cases that are like big in, in media right now, where they, they're not they're not getting to argue the facts of the case. They're just getting to argue how many, how much in damages uh, it takes. And sometimes the judge will actually just already go ahead and, and decide that even. So it, it, it could be pretty punitive. I thought this case was interesting for a lot of reasons, but in terms of PAs and NPs in emergency medicine, who here is in emergency medicine and does the duty of provider in triage sometimes? Who gets to do that thankless task? Anybody here? Provider and triage. Okay. Of those of you who get to do provider and triage, if you love that job, raise your hand high. Some days I love it. Really? Some days it's really slow. Oh. We're talking for like, I'm talking 20 minutes at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> right. And then the rest <laughs> of the day, it's off to the races after that, right? No, it's really crazy because like there'll be like two or three patients and there's literally zero to do. And, and so sometimes I really enjoy just coming in mm. and knowing. But other days... I'm going to say 98% of the days it's not. But on the days that are like that, I really like it. Yeah, I get a lot of work done on those days, honestly. Yeah, I checked my work. email that day. Yeah. The, the hard part about it is like expecting, like, it's Sunday morning. I'm in provider and triage. What could go wrong? And then you're just running your butt off the entire shift. You're like, this place, I hate this. And you're like, oh, man, it's still <laughs> Sunday. No, nothing's <laughs> open. Okay. So, so, so in, in terms of provider and triage, why, like, it's, it's rare that when, you know, of course, when you're not doing anything, you love provider and triage. Sure. But when it's busy, it's a tough job because it's just um, it's a parade of sadness, you know? You want to say something about provider and triage? Yeah, go ahead. What's your name? Hi, Gloria. Oh, okay. Perfect. Oh, looks oh. like I'm right. No, that? I'm sorry. That is, it, well, at my hospital, it is not allowed. You guys just don't follow so, CMS? I no, mean, don't get down with CMS. <laughs> We're a general <laughs> hospital. I can go back and, I mean, we just had a conversation about this. In fact, I believe the quote was like, actually, I won't quote. I'm just saying it's, we have to do it. I'm sure Gloria will give you her contact information. You can pass that along to the CEO of the hospital. She's like, don't And you me. guys can talk about this. Okay, what this state? should go really well. <laughs> what state are you in? Hey. Okay. I think Clear thinking Texan Texas over thing. here. What's yeah, going on over go. here? So bizarre. So what Kim, just because Kim doesn't have a microphone on right now, unfortunately, okay? So, and by the way, so number one, Gloria mentioned, she was off mic too, if we didn't catch us on the thing. Gloria says CMS states that an, a trained RN can perform a medical screening exam meeting EMTALA requirements. That's very interesting. That's I'm what I was told that. as well. I'm not finding that right now. Martha, Martha is not satisfied with Gloria's explanation. Kim, nurse practitioner from Nebraska, is saying that she, as a patient, went to an emergency department and was never seen by a clinician. Uh, the, the RN, essentially, called the clinician on the phone. They directed the RN to do X, Y, and Z, and then Kim was discharged from the hospital. I'll so, just say it's very interesting. M, uh, the CMS states that an RN has, if they have a specific training to do MSC, what is that training? So the question out here is whether it has to do with ESI training, things like that. Yeah. So I think the question it would it would take and, and it's critical access to CMS. Right. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's that's what well, I'm reading in the right statement. Okay. Yeah, from CMS. So it's hospital specific. Then for me, we just we're not accepting it at our hospital either. We that, don't have the I training, think, yeah. like. Maybe the nurses do, they do assign ESI levels, but they haven't been deemed trained or they were not paying for the training or whatever our preference is. Yeah. So that what's being said right now is that like, is assigning an ESI level, is that the same as doing a medical screening or is it similar in some ways? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are important differences there. But they're not listed. Uh, hmm. uh, Can... Yeah. 
yeah, yeah we, we all wish we knew more yeah, about we this, didn't, this yeah. we can, intense we care. Think, we would love yeah. to know more about this. Okay, well, so we're going to dive more into this in a little well, bit. We'll, 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 can, can I, because I, I found like the actual yes. CMS document. Okay, okay. so, okay. So, okay. so apparently, apparently it is specifically for critical access hospitals, okay. which I think would help. Was it a critical access hospital you were talking about as well? Oh, okay, okay, okay. And so but I assume you're talking about Nebraska. That's going to be critical access hospital. <laughs> right, right. No, no, that's why I said that, because I get that, having worked there, too. So it's like, a pretzel dem so, rule, basically. So, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a critical access. So you have to be a critical access yeah. hospital, and this is only permitted if the RN on site immediately available when an individual comes to the critical access hospital's emergency department and requests examination or treatment. That's number one. Number two, the RN has training and experience in emergency care. Number three, the nature of the request for medical care is within the scope of practice of an RN and consistent with applicable state laws and the critical access hospitals bylaws or rules and regulations. And then the last part is, if the RN knows initially that the medical screening exam of the presenting complaint is outside of his or her scope of practice, or if the RN begins the emergency medical screening and determines that the nature of of the individual's condition is outside his or her scope of practice, the critical access hospital's physician, PA, NP, or clinical nurse specialist must be contacted to see the patient within 30 minutes or 60 minutes if in a remote That's, area or permissible under yeah. the state's rural health care plan, which is actually, I think, what um, uh, Kim, right, was, was talking about. And this is, not, this is something I've definitely seen before is that you're in a rural enough environment that really RNs are the only ones who are around to staff this. And so this is permitted in critical access hospitals where the RN can, like, start the treatment. This is definitely stuff I've heard. Um, is, is, like, they start it as the, like, PAs coming from home or whatever, um, because I, I've um, I've considered working in those kind of kind of places there too because of, of how that's set up. But um, I learned something today because I didn't realize there was that exception for RNs and critical access hospitals. So yeah, there's that. And apparently this is old. This is 2006. Yeah. Does it say anything about requiring this nurse to do a physical examination? Uh, because usually, and it's really busy. There might be just two words in that. A document. Yes, they've assigned a level, but it's like if so, the oh, sorry. Days. If so, the surveyors must confirm that the critical access hospitals bylaws or rules and regulations provide for RNs to conduct screening examinations with their scope of practice consistent with the state law, and the RNs performing such examinations are documenting training experience in emergency mm -hmm. care. But it doesn't actually really go into like physical exams, stuff like that. But I, I think to, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your, your, your name, but, but the, the, the third comment uh, from the crowd is that like, you know, is, is ESI or whatever triage level system, because there's different ones out there, um, is, is that the same thing as an MSE? And, and it's, it's not, it's kind of like the first step of the process there. Um, and, and, you know, that, that becomes its own kind of pit of despair and nightmares as far as like how patients like anchor bias really sets in when someone gets lab labeled as an ESI four, when really they've got things that are more like ESI two going on, but that's a, that's yeah, a that separate piece. That happens. We're not going to get into that, but that does happen a lot, but. Well, regardless of who's doing your MSC, whether it's you or I, or a trained RN at a critical access hospital, that, that person doing a medical screening exam early is really important. This poor chap five hours, never got to see someone trained to do a medical screening exam. Um, you know, I, I think maybe it's cold comfort on those days where you're just getting crushed in provider and triage. But understand that as hard as that job is, you really do a good job for your patients. You are up front at the bleeding edge of your emergency department, and you're seeing these patients, and you are uh, or you're directing traffic. You know, you go here, you go here, get this test done, you can wait a little bit. So. Um, that's kind of what I tell myself when I'm, when I'm hating life and doing yeah. provider and triage. It's like, this is important. This is important. I should be doing this. So I think, you know, we want to give you solutions. You know, okay. I, I, I would just like to say that I think to, to solve something like this, we do something in our hospital called patient first. And so I, I see what happened here, right? The patient came in, they registered, they went to a chair and fell asleep. Okay. They didn't get their MSE of any kind. And every time someone called for them, they're like, you know, patient W, patient W, no response, patient W, they marked call one. Come back out, patient W, marked call two, and then marked call three and took them off the board. Or um, in this case, the patient was ordered out by security later. So what we do is every hour we go around and we touch the body. Who are you? <laughs> if you don't have a bracelet on, yeah. we get you one. 
If you're like, oh my God, something's a lot worse, then we reevaluate you. So that's what patient first is all about. And I think that's a solution to prevent things like this from happening. There. I just had to speak from the rural hospital side that it's cool that you have pro a provider and triage deal, but we don't have that and we're <laughs> not going to get that. So for all of y'all who didn't raise your hands, I understand because you probably don't have that in your system, in which case like you really do have to trust your triage nurses just that much more. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I try and invite them like, hey, if something is off protocol, if you don't have protocols for whatever, like feel free to call me and ask questions like, uh, and, and on, on the really, really bad days, like I will sometimes kind of do quick scans of, of the waiting room to realize like, oh, this person's super sick and we missed this one. Yeah. So, you know, th those are the types of things you want to try and catch. But, but realistically, it can be really hard if you're in a setting that doesn't have even a, a pit system. Here's the next case. I called it. Uh, here I go again on my own for all you white snake. Nice. It's white snake. Yes. Yeah, it's white snake. Very good. All right. That was my class so, song in high school. So was mine. <laughs> really? That oh. song? Yeah, it yeah. was. It was. It was in our yearbook too. Under anybody yeah. that for, like either forgot or refused to fill out their profile, we put the quote in there. <laughs> oh, Dang. well, we didn't do that one. Oh. But I, I like wow, that. That's really crazy. Yeah. Well, there's no word on whether Mrs. M likes white steak or not. But in the <laughs> end, she sought treatment at her local medical clinic for belly pain. A PA saw her, and uh, this is why I think is interesting: bloating, nausea, lower abdominal and back pain, both diarrhea and constipation. So nice. was it like the diarrhea was stuck, or were you like having a lot of constipation? I don't know what happened there. Okay, vomiting and a recurrent fever. So a lot's going on. Hand positive. Yeah, like abdominal just pain. Draw a line through all the abdominal pain symptoms, basically saying yes. Okay, so Mrs. P ordered an abdominal radiograph, which revealed a distended abdomen. I see. Okay, so anybody, how, how do you guys feel about that? Raise your hand if you have questions here, or like our concerns a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, not, not a huge fan of the, uh, unless I'm looking for a like foreign body or something, I'm not getting That's it. That's where I make AUV this sign. Only. Waste of time. <laughs> Waste. Okay. But you also get radiation. Yeah, why? Why? I can, uh, uh, distended abdomen, Jesus. I mean, that's. Okay. Can't you and, and, just looking at the patient? Like, yeah. hey, your abdomen is this thing. Now, this is, to, to be fair, this is a clinic 9 ED, right? At yeah, this point. Is, this is so, clinic. so Fine. given, I, I, I still am very much the, in, in the advocate of, and one of the reasons why I don't work in an urgent care at all is because I'm like, if I would have done a CT on this patient when you're in the ED and I'm only stuck with x-ray, like, I don't really like that option. But understanding that that might be the only tool you have, in which case we should have a good discussion about how the limitations of that. So I got, I got a hundred tuning forks, Mike knows. Okay? <laughs> I got a hundred tuning forks and a patient comes in with toe pain. Well, I mean, it's a great tool, Chip. I mean, it's a great you tool. You know, I actually, I mean, in a rural enough place, have used that to help detect fractures. You know, okay. You know what? what was your there is evidence to this. It's in like the gallons or some shit. And there's evidence so. that just because this is a good tool, radiographs are good tools for things, doesn't mean that it's a good tool. I'm just playing devil's advocate well, here. I just said that I would do a CT with this person. Okay, fine. You know, if this is going to be Jesus, Jesus, Martha, mean. I, I'm not, I was not being mean. I was just Aggressive. Now you're being aggressive. All right. So All listen. Hostile workplace. Yeah. So I, 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 I understand, but just because you have it and it's the unnecessarily like maybe, okay, fine. What might you see with the, let's be positive here. What might you see on that plain film that will change your workup or plan? Tell me. Would you, how often, what percentage would you see? Oh, no, I know it's shit. I just did a presentation it's like on this. Eight, what is yeah, it, 8 to 12%? I think it's, yeah, I was going to say it's around, yeah. it's around that. It's not great, but so, I mean, you know, and then, cool if you find it. Okay, but. Makes pretty pictures. <laughs> All right. So is it still my turn? Maybe yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so we got an x-ray. So we got this x-ray. Man, who knew I would be that passionate about that? I did. Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> We've been friends for a long time. Okay, so Mrs. Miss P did not order any additional diagnostic tests, like not even a rapid that, UA. The, the people in the crowd are lighting pitchfork. Uh, writing, you don't light a pitchfork. You, light, you, light a I mean, you could light a you, pitchfork. You you pitchfork. Could. You get, it wouldn't do very much, but right, I get it. Okay. Actually, that's kind of a cool tool. A lit pitchfork? Yeah. You know, like you could burn a lot of hay. That's like a spork. It does yeah. two things. Hay fires are some of the worst fires, I'm telling you. Like, okay, we're not talking about that. All right, all right we're not <laughs> off topic, but... Okay, moving forward. So then Miss P and Dr. S, we have a doctor involved now. This is interesting. It's getting interesting. The collaborating physician agreed Mrs. M, the patient, had some temporary condition, put her on a clear liquid diet uh, for the next few days. 
I'm not fully opposed to clear liquid diets in the next few days, but like we have some concerns. Okay, I have concerns. All right, so the next day, Mrs. M returned, complaining of her pain had not subsided. That's a, like a, a hand raise for me right there. Yeah. Because of your bounce back, you're automatically like concerning. So she was seen by Mr. R and NP, who had the same supervising physician as the BA. And the NP also diagnosed Mrs. M with mild digestive disorder, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean, and instructed her to stick to a bland liquid diet. Those are a lot, uh, a lot better than severe digestive disorders and just a little better than moderate digestive disorders is our mild digestive disorders, exactly. <laughs> All right, Mr. M said, enough of this-ish. I am uh, taking my wife to the ED, the local hospital. The EM physician noted, wow, you've got a lot of pain and you're disoriented and you have a fever. So let's do some stuff. And so they did some labs and imaging ultrasound CT and figured out, hey, some sort of inflammatory reaction is going on. There's probably an appendicitis going on. Right. So air medevac, okay? Whoa, things got serious to another hospital. We know how expensive, $30,000 for one of those. When a surgeon performed an appendectomy and she recovered, the Mr. and Mrs. M team consulted with a plaintiff attorney and filed a medical malpractice case against the clinic. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so neither the PA nor the NP were found liable in this case. This is where things get really interesting. Uh, they may have been largely due to the technical failure of the plaintiff's uh, uh, failure to submit expert testimony supporting their case. And is there one more point there? Oh, oh no. Okay. Actually, yeah. So, so this is this is really yeah. really crazy. Um, now, depending on your state, and and I don't think we found out which state this was in, right? But no. but more and more with tort reform, uh, more states are requiring that one, in some cases even two, expert witnesses um, have to uh, support that this is a reasonable complaint and that this is something you can present. And before you can even present this case to a court to file a malpractice suit, you have to have an expert witness, or like I said, in some cases two, say that, yes, this is reasonably, like, outside of the standard of care, this is negligence, this is malpractice, this is something that should be sued, um, which is really easy to find. Like, you can find uh, guns for hire really quickly as far as, like, you know, can make anyone say that, yes, this is good standard or not. Um, in most cases, when those... Um, when those attorneys seek, seek those expert witnesses and they have to submit, um, like, usually a, a basic just brief the expert witness does about, you know, why they feel this way, this is something that they're also uh, committing to themselves to this case that they will testify if need be in court. So this is usually a little bit of a process, but it's not incredibly hard. This is something that is, like, bread and butter for plaintiff's attorneys to know that this is something you need to do. But instead, it just all went to hell, right? Right, Mike? Yeah, basically, the, the appeal, this went to an appeal court. So there was a first court case, plaintiffs lost, went to an appeal court. The appeal court said, uh, plaintiffs, you don't have a medical expert even suggesting that the PA, the NP, the physician did the wrong thing here. Um, since you don't have an expert here, we're just going to go ahead and throw this case out. So, I think the PA and NP got lucky as incredibly all lucky about this. Well, but this was a motion to dismiss too. Like this, this never even got to it. Like, like this never got to a trial. This was yeah. This no jury was, ever saw this. Yeah, this was uh, like this went. Judge said, yeah, like you don't, you haven't met the the standard that you need to to say that this is the case, and so. Then the uh, uh, plaintiff's attorney, who I think only really argued this, it sounds like, on the appeal. So the appellant attorney said, like, wait a second. No, because I can just go ahead and, uh, you know, phone a friend and say that it's the case. Well, you can't do that now. Well, then that's fine. You know, this is uh, a lay person, right? That was the thing. Like, a lay person could tell that this was appendicitis. You know, it was basically what was being argued. It's like, but really? Really? You're going to go with that? Well, apparently so, not, so right? I mean, right. The question I want to ask is, let's say it did go. Um, who was responsible? Responsible, the physician, the MP, the PA, or all of them? I think, uh, yeah, answer choice D, all of the above, unfortunately. I mean, uh, you know, the initial PA, it, you know what, it's always easy on the bounce back to catch the emergency, right? It's like, uh, you know, oh, you're bouncing back to me in the urgent care, and you're still tachycardic and hypoxic, and now your leg is red. I guess that wasn't pneumonia on the first x-ray, like you go to the ER. So, like, same as the first case, it's really hard for me to kind of sharpshoot Okay, so how about this? Because I'm a catty person, it's very easy for me to sharpshoot initial clinicians, but I have to resist the urge to do that. I have to think about, like, 
look, you know, I wasn't there that day. I don't know what happened in that care. I, I can only, you know, uh, you know, somewhat opine on, on the care. So in terms of the first PA, um, that one's tricky. I mean, fever, abdominal pain, you have to question on whether you have the appropriate modalities in an urgent care to fully roll out an emergency. Like, I work in urgent care. I love it, by the way. Who works urgent care? Anybody here works urgent care? Yeah, okay. So, how about this? Urgent care providers on the first time that person came through. Knowing what you know, not assuming too much. Which of you in urgent care would have sent the patient to the ED that day, the first day? Some, some mix. Was that, that was 50. the day she was pan positive, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is too much. You, listen, I'm here to do these things. You got to go. The abdominal pain, chest pain, they, they're go. I think there's a it's discussion to be had. Yeah. I don't know if I would absolutely have done that. Why not even a pregnancy test? Did we know how old this person was? Yeah. I, I'm, I am so curious about why there was That's absolutely strange. no diagnostics further done, like not a year. You know, maybe she refused not them. A, maybe they had a shared decision making possible. and it wasn't documented. Yeah. Who knows? So let's say there's no, maybe they didn't want that. Okay. So. Again, urgent care people, raise your hands and drop them if you would send them on the second day. Drop your hands if you'd send them on the second day. Send them to the ER on the second day if you drop them. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm taking that wrong. I was going to say, so the drop hands that are your hand if you would send them to the ER that second day. <laughs> so anyone who still has their hands up would not have taken them the second day is what we're trying to say here. Okay, interesting. Okay. So I think there is discussion among reasonable people about whether which time they should have gone to the ED, if any. Um, my personal take in the urgent care, when I'm in urgent care and someone comes back for the same problem, I'm all done with you at urgent care, especially when it's abdominal pain. Now, if it's a hangnail, like, okay, I got this. Yeah. You know, but like, if it's something like you're coming back for chest pain, for abdominal pain, for uncontrollable extremity pain, I, I have to understand my limitations in urgent care. And so as much as I, I can do a lot in urgent care, I feel like I feel like I'm very skilled and I can have these good in-depth discussions in urgent care because I've been doing it for a while. At the same time, I have to, you know, a, a man's got to know his limitations. What movie is that from, Chip? Uh, Someone knows. I mean, I dropped all the other ones. I didn't ask yeah, you yeah, what they came from. Yes. Fair. It's from a movie. Anyways, I think in urgent care, we have to know our limitations. And when someone comes back for something that could be life-threatening, which abdominal pain is one of those things, I think it's worth having a discussion with a patient about, hey, maybe this is not the place for you. Maybe you need to go somewhere where we can do a few more tests just in case something serious is going on. I'm not bagging on anyone who says they wouldn't have sent because again, we're kind of operating with one, you know, yeah. brain cell behind our backs here. We don't know everything about this case, but I would put it to you that if you are urgent care PA or NP and someone bounces back um, and they're not better for a condition, at least document the discussion about whether this person should, should go to the ER or not. There's a the fantastic system. series, by the way, called uh, Literally Bounce Back. It's Mike yeah. Weinstock. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh, it's it, it definitely, definitely worth looking at. Also interviewed him on the podcast. I thought about that when you were mentioning Kevin Clower. I'm like, we, we, we did stuff with him too. But uh, he's got a great Bounce Back series, which is a series of books um, that literally go into cases like this and talk about the things that were missed along the way and what we could do to be better about it. And uh, I think the biggest thing to take away from this is that when someone does come back, you really do have to, to think about that more about what's going on there. doesn't necessarily mean that there's always something really bad going on. Just the fact that you need to really take a little more time. You know, was this because of education? Like that, that's the number one bounce back I see is just the fact that the first person who saw him just didn't educate enough. And, yeah. and simply a little more education would have gone a long way there. But then there's obviously bad stuff. My, my sort of final thought on this is that kind of take all of this out for a second. Like, how many of you right now, I understand that some people, and if you don't want to share, that's fine. Some people have chronic illnesses and are in pain every day, all day. I understand that. But how many of you have belly pain right now? Like actively have belly pain? Well, after the food last night. Yeah, well, like, okay. You, you that's a different kind of pain, right? Having abdominal pain, severe abdominal pain is not a normal thing. That's how I always think about abdominal pain. Because I knew the last time I had abdominal pain really bad. It was an appendicitis, hmm. and it was, and I joined that club. It is a different kind of pain, and so it's not normal to be walking around with severe chest pain. It's not normal to be walking around pan-positive abdominal pain. It's not normal to be, I can't walk, my foot hurts so bad. So when you really think about seeing these patients, when it's really that bad, like, you know, they're not faking it. And if they are, that's a very, 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 very small percent of the patients that you're seeing. Well, I know... 
most people here are waiting for us to give away this course. Let's go ahead and proceed to this. Real quick, last month's trivia, we do on the two of you these two-part trivia questions where there's two pieces of information. Um, oh, real quick, before we go into this, all these cases we discussed will be at our website. That is uh, twoview.fireside.fm. That's the number two view.fireside.fm, and you can see every case we're talking about here and more about this trivia question. So, Peyronie's disease is named after what or who, and approximately what year was it first identified? If you all will indulge me, I'm going to work on my French pronunciation here. I, I did spend 10 years in Canada, after all, okay? <laughs> this is the French surgeon, François Gijot de la Peyronie. <laughs> How'd I do? Pretty good. The penis Pretty good. guy. Pretty good. The penis <laughs> AKA guy. the penis guy. Can you imagine this guy? He's like, I'm not just the penis guy. Yeah, okay? you know like, what? Okay, I got you. <laughs> and it was diagnosed in Some 17. Some of you are awake now. She said penis. <laughs> and the winner. Wait, wait, was, hold on. Can we talk about how Kevin said if you haven't seen an uncircumcised penis? There's one in room two. <laughs> no, we don't have to talk about that. Okay. The winner is Travis Turnage. Uh, Travis is a new PA in emergency <laughs> medicine, and he wrote in with this answer, these two answers here. So, Good job, Travis. Now it's time for you here in Las Vegas to win something. Get ready, America. So what we'll do is this. Just because it's hard with hands, I, if it's okay, because if you want to win this, I, if it's okay, I want you to stand up, and we'll look for the first person standing. So get, get ready in terms of your seats if you must, okay? Got, get, get ready to stand here. up Catch for this, everything. and we will look for the first person standing Please don't bang your knees on the thing. Uh, we are the two of you are not liable for any sort of injuries from this <laughs> trivia contest here. Okay, here we go. It's a two-part question. Well, if you stand up, you better be able to rattle off the two answers quickly. Here we go. Ooh. Martha, you can read this? Oh, am I going to read it? Well, I'll have you read it. Here we go. Okay. In what 2009 movie did a group of friends, a wolf heck, if you will... That's only a one. We have to... Wait, wait, wait. Sh -sh -sh -sh. Check into Caesar's Palace for a wild couple of days. That's the first you, part. That's the first part. You have to get both and, parts. And name a musical act that is currently performing on a previously performed at a Caesar's Palace. Hey, so what's your name? Wait, wait, you stood up, but you went back down. So you're reneging? Okay, I, then go ahead. That's legit. She the won. Hangover and Garth oh, correct. There we, we go. go. All right. What's your name? What do you do? Wow. Stephanie Canning from Montana, and you are PANP. Sure. Well, thanks for being here, yes, and congratulations. You. you just won a free course. Okay, it's awesome. Come after the show. Great. All yeah. right. So um, we are going to uh, have more uh, about all of these things, like I said, on our website, twoview.fireside.fm. Our email address is twoviewcast at gmail.com. You can get more information on all the different courses we do. That's going to be at www.ccme.org. That's a Center of Medication website. Um, we're going to have to believe a point here. Look on our website for these new courses coming up. Thank you for listening and attending this live episode of The Two of You. You can rate us on all the places you want to rate us. And uh, our show audio video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave Pett. Show notes are by Meg Dipple. I'm going to let Chip do my line. Oh, nice. Because I oh. love him that much. He's just so astute and wonderful. And I'm thanks for being here. This, this one, right? Yeah. All right. So thank you again for tuning in, friends and email. Share this podcast with a friend. Share your thoughts via email. And thanks for sharing your time with us today at The Two View. Have a good day and a great shift. Right. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody. That's my Ken Mill mic, you know, like. All right. Let's go ahead and start with this first question here. What about a well-known homeless patient? who has been seen multiple times in one day and complains of it's too cold outside with no medical complaints. Is it safe to put that in your note as malingering? I think it's safe, but I don't think they're malingering. If it's cold outside, it's accurate. So and now if they're going to fake a complaint, you've seen them for chest pain three times that day and you know it's because they don't have shelter, well, that's malingering. And I think um, you could certainly list that. In, in today's climate, as we talked about with people having access to the record, I think you want to be careful. What is the likelihood of the homeless person invoking their right to go to medical records and get a copy of the record? I think it's unlikely. Malingering is a medical term. I think you can use it. But if you're saying, listen, I have anywhere to go and it's too cold outside, I think that's a truthful statement. So I think it's a different issue. The issue is, you know, do we provide social services? Do we provide shelter for patients without medical complaints? Uh, I think that's a difficult challenge, 
But I would say to a limited extent, yes, but that can't be what acute care hospitals do or you won't have beds for people who have medical complaints. So we help when we can and, um, and we preserve those beds for people who need us to provide medical care. So in this case, you can put malingering in. I probably would not. I would say they have social needs. We'll try and address them. And if not, we'll find a shelter or we'll send them out tomorrow or whatever we need to do. All of these, uh, you know, social determinants of health, that's kind of a, you know, relatively recently hot phrase in medicine here. These are things that, you know, hey, look, life gets in the way sometimes. And there are things that get in the way of you accessing care and other things. There are things like income insecurity, housing insecurity, things like that. Those are real issues that affect patients' health sometimes with, with real morbidity and mortality behind them. And so those are diagnostic codes you can put you know, as ICD-10 codes as well. And then, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, you know, Kevin, you, you, you live in Florida, correct, at this point. I live in Dallas. Even in Dallas, Texas, people come in legitimately hypothermic. You know, that is a medical emergency to be in the cold and to be exposed, especially if you have wet clothes and you're unable to seek shelter from the cold and the wet. So this really hurts people. Um, and, and I think that you, uh, exactly what I think you just said is basically, Let's see what resources we have to bring to bear here. Is it it's safe to say malingering? It's not unsafe. At the same time, is it helpful? Not, not really. No. People, people get it. Like when they read the chart and you say, this is the patient's fourth visit to this ED today, and you describe why they're here. Um, this is similar to previous visits today. A full workup has already been completed twice today in this patient. People can read between the lines without you taking the hammer and, and, and hitting the whack-a-mole on the head to say malingering. Okay, they get it. All right. How about discerning between a rash associated with fever viral exanthem versus a medication reaction? Many allergies in kids come from rash allergy. How can we avoid having this on their chart forevermore? A lot of different things kind of peppered in here. One thing I, I want to say straight off the bat is a lot of times parents will say a child will have an allergy, and then you say, well, what was the reaction? And they'll say they threw up, right? So not necessarily an allergy, maybe an adverse reaction, or maybe they just had a viral illness that made them puke. Secondly, parents will say, well, I'm allergic to penicillin, so my child therefore is, which is not correct. So, you know, you can help correct that phrase. In addition, penicillin is still a really great drug. Last time I checked, penicillin still treats a lot of things. And it's the first line agent for several things, including syphilis, and there's a shortage of it. But regardless, if someone really does have a penicillin allergy, I would consider telling them, hey, maybe some desensitization or testing, like to make sure that you really do have an allergy. Um, and then what you're talking about here in regards to discerning between a rash associated with a fever versus viral versus a medication reaction, sometimes we don't know. Remember how I talked about, you know, there's some classic signs and symptoms, and we can say it's definitely this, but most of the time these things are self-limiting and they get better. We're looking for those really key classic signs and symptoms that make us think this is really bad or ugly, right? Um, and the rash allergy, there are some times where people have had rashes for weeks, months, years. I mean, you're not saying, like, that's not my problem. But it, it, you know, do your best. Give it your best shot. And then follow up with dermatology that might need to biopsy it. Um, is it really suspicious for maybe cancerous something? Um, you know, catching those melanomas. I mean, they can, you can save people's lives. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I think, honestly, this question is outstanding because it, it begs a, a higher level question. Yeah. Why do we prescribe antibiotics for people who we think have a viral illness? This is the, one of the problems that can occur from it. So you know with kids, they're very likely to develop some sort of a rash with a viral exanthem with a viral illness, and that's the more likely cause. But then they get a rash, and even if you tell the parents, we don't, we don't know for sure, hey, they had amoxicillin and, um, and, and they, have a, they have an allergy. So uh, try and avoid it, try and, to avoid the confusion. If something like mononucleosis and you prescribed amoxicillin or ampicillin, well, then they're going to have a characteristic rash. It's not, it's not um, uh, an allergy. And as Martha said, if it's really a concern, they need to be tested later. You don't want to take penicillin and penicillin-related agents completely off the table for them for a lifespan because they had a rash when they had a fever and they, it was most likely a viral exanthem. Bye-bye, Zosin.
right? There you go. Bye bye Zosin. I know. Bye bye Augmentin. I know. If you the penicillin allergy. Seriously, and and I think you know, as we talked about those classic signs and symptoms, when did you get the rash, right? And unfortunately, sometimes, as Kevin said, you know, you get that antibiotic and they think it's associated, but it really wasn't. They would have gotten that rash anyway. Uh, but know your rashes and be like, you know, I'm confident. And if you're not, get a, get a friend in there to help you out. I mean, you don't have to figure it all out on your own. And if you are alone, well, I mean, I'd say call me, but it depends on the time, you know? <laughs> text, call Kevin. Text me first, He's right? the lawyer. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> All right, Mike, go ahead. You, you're, I took your thunder here. That's okay. It's, it's everyone's thunder to be had. I would say that it's not mandatory if somebody comes in with rash and they just took amoxicillin. It's not mandatory for the nursing staff to add that as an allergy immediately. There's nothing that requires that, okay? Um, I have delisted allergies on patients before because it was obvious. It's like, this says you have an amoxicillin allergy. Um, your records say you just took Augmentin last week and, and it went fine. Yeah. Oh yeah, I take Augmentin all the time. I was like, hey, so let's talk about your amoxicillin allergy. Like what that means exactly. Can I remove this? And like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making my discussion very brief for the purpose of this panel, but I have a, a fair discussion and I say, well, look, I think there's good benefit to be had to taking this off of your um, you know, allergy list. How do you feel about us doing that here today? And they say, yeah, let's do that. I've obviously had amoxicillin. Cool, you know, patient consents. We, you know, we discuss the benefits and risks and, and off it goes, you know, and they're free to have amoxicillin again. So I that's a thing you could do. The clinicians, uh, ha, uh, the NPs, PAs, and docs had the ability to change it in Epic. If anybody knows. I do. You do? Yeah. See, I don't have the ability. Talk to your IT person. You know, they don't let me do a lot of things, so. You, you have the ability. You don't have the authority, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get in there and change all kinds of stuff. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> Moving forward. Go ahead. This is actually kind of a reunion. Um, if anybody follows the Total EM podcast, the fantastic podcast run by none other than Chip Lang, PA, Chip had Kevin on a couple years ago to talk about documentation issues, MDM stuff. And so a couple of these next things kind of are right down um, the pipe on those topics. And, and I bet that... Probably their, their approach is the same, but it's good to kind of bring up. These are kind of common topics that go not just to charting, because I can just see eyes glazing over when I say, let's talk about charting now. In the end, these are communication issues. And we are all communicating with our patients, whether it's verbally or in written documentation. So I think there's a lot to be said about the informants of communication and not just charting, and as well as with nursing staff here. So how about this, right? Um, very commonly, the triage nurse's notes are quite brief because that's their job, is to briefly get a feel for what's going on here, take some quick vitals, and off you go to the next station here. Do you as the clinician go back and change the nursing triage notes if your observation differs, or do you chart that you disagree with those notes? Does my detailed HPI just is the trump card. Said, like, whatever they said doesn't matter. I'm saying this. Uh, how do y'all handle this when there are important discrepancies? Um, like, maybe, like, changing what a workup might be in a patient. Yeah, from my estimation, you probably don't want to get into a back and forth about what someone else thought was, was appropriate. They can document what they need to document. But as we talked about, you know, a, a couple of hours ago, you know, um, you should specifically state why you believe something different. Now, there are exceptions. So it is a right arm injury and the triage note says left, you might want to say, hey, you might want to adjust your documentation. It's inaccurate. But if you say, I wasn't there when you did your triage, so I don't know what was said, but I'm going to tell you what you heard and what you synthesized and the data you received and documented is wrong. It's just, it's, a, it's not a great look for you and it's, and it's going to be hard to convince somebody that they heard something different and they documented it incorrectly. What you can do is make sure that you've, you've acknowledged it. They said this, I've spoken with the patient at greater length. This is not a triage note and this is what I found. So therefore it's not this. I and like I think what you said earlier, um, worst headache of my life, the patient did, you reiterated that, but I've had that same worst headache of my life every week. So. That's an actual example. That's, yeah. That was a good one. I actually, I'm going to steal that one. You can have it. You can Thanks. have it. Thank you it's so all much. yours. It's all yours. Chip, how do you react to this when there's a discrepancy between what you see and what the triage nurse saw? Yeah, I, I think it mostly echoes Kevin as far as um, how, how this goes with, you know, I, 
does it get you bonus points if you argue the point with them? No, but it is something worth documenting that this is what they're telling me now. Um, and, and sometimes if it really is a, hey, there was that misunderstanding. I gave the example, I think, yesterday of the patient who came in, you know, where the triage nurse said it was a cough and they came in with chest pain and it ends up being a STEMI. Yeah. Like they, they took that information, just like you said, synthesized that information down to it's a cough. Mm -hmm. And I synthesized that information to, hey, the patient is complaining of chest pain. That's what they actually uh, that's what they claim that they actually said in triage. So I'm going to at least acknowledge that, put that in there and move on. Like I'm not, I'm not going to hit it too hard, but it's worth recognizing that. And, and having seen lawsuits where literally this is a topic in there, like one of the big arguments, uh, it, it is worth uh, addressing it directly. The other one that's worth addressing is if you have a feeling that the vital signs are not correct in triage, uh, then that is something else to, 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 or at any point in the care, but um, I've I've had you know patients who come back where like the blood pressure has literally read like eighty over zero. Okay, well I know that probably wasn't correct because this patient right now is one twenty over eighty. I think when we were going through the screens really quickly, we probably missed something, and so now. I want to make sure that we get that corrected. That's something that I usually will just call triage and say, hey, I think the vital signs, especially since I can't change and I don't want to be able to change the vital signs or the uh, triage note. Like I don't want to have access. And I don't want to change that. That gets real messy real quick. But I do want to say, hey, this is what happened. And then I'll acknowledge because... Um, another thing, if you don't know this about charts, is that meta the metadata is there and uh, a really good oh, yeah. attorney has access to that, like we'll figure out how to get that metadata. And uh, if it shows that you had access to chart information, you changed it, there are gonna be more questions sometimes when that comes up. And, and that's something that, again, it's, it's good to know what's there, address it, but make sure you're addressing it in a way that, uh, again, it puts, puts everything in an overall positive light. I recognize that this was a mistake. I discussed it this is what happened, you know, and it doesn't have to be exhaustive, just have some information there. You know, actually, Kevin, I want to ask you, this actually happened recently, that one of our um, nurse practitioners saw a patient, the patient was fine, like the patient was totally fine, and the nurses said that the patient was fine, but then the patient died, I mean, like, just straight up died, and she was like, I, is kind of dying. So I she kind of wasn't fine. No, I'm telling you, it was, so I saw something this. Something wasn't fine, I'm, Martha. It was so bizarre. <laughs> I'm telling you, normal vital signs. Yeah. I saw the, I was, you know, this was a triage yeah. experience. And, um, and the patient walked, was ambulatory, you know, was, I heard them talking, I saw them. And then the nurse practitioner went home and then later I'm like, that, wait, this is the same patient they died? She's like, should I go back in and, and update my chart? No. And I said, absolutely not. No, because when you saw the patient, that's what those were the vital signs. That's what the patient said to you. So don't be tempted to do that would be my... No, absolutely. Don't do retrospective documentation yeah. because it, it reflects that, you're first of all, you're using information that wasn't available at the time, and then it implies that you wish you had done something different. Yeah. Don't do it. And there are cases like that. Maybe it was, they were there with an ankle sprain, and they, whatever, they had, the, you know... They, That's their massive they had heart something attack. they had something happen that was unrelated and they you know and they died for some unrelated reason you don't know but certainly that can happen but i was i've seen many people go back in especially we talked about finishing your records oh when you've documented your record then after you found out you need to make it really clear because you'll be asked when you documented this chart it was two days after that you saw the patient and they had already died were you aware they died um, I, would make it, I would make it clear in the record at that point. I'm, I'm documenting this retrospectively because of the volume in the, in, in the emergency department at that time. I deferred to patient care. I'm documenting this based only on my findings prior to discharge of the patient. Wow, even I don't do that. Now I will. Yeah. Oh my well, God. if you That's... document it later, just have a little canned statement because somebody can easily say, oh, yeah, look at all of this extra physical examination stuff. You were perfect. Yeah, you documented after you knew the patient died. Wow. So be really careful with that. But back to this mm. scenario, sometimes yeah. people's time is their time. It doesn't have to do any has, doesn't have to do anything with why they came in. But it does beg the question: Was there something we needed to ask or do to to really connect those dots? If they did come to us, was it really something that we missed? Mm. Not to belabor it too much, but I mean exactly like what you said. And that happened in our department not too long ago, where we had someone who died. And the thing was, they they, they bounced back so quickly afterwards, you couldn't finish the chart. Yeah. And so. But it was just like you said, it, it, um, 
because it was, okay, how do we document this? And exactly what you said, you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge the fact that this is not going to look the best, but also putting that, I'm going to put the information as I saw it at the time. Um, the other thing that I like to do that you, you kind of touched on, and this is true to use, not just in these like extreme cases like this, but um, when you have when you have a really, really busy ED, things are backed up. It's taking them four hours to get a CT. When you have this big gap in your note, as far as like, well, what happened in those four hours? Um, I like to put in there that, you know, like if I did, obviously, like I rechecked the patient, but due to the high volume and acuity, this patient's CT has been delayed again. I discussed this with whoever trying to like putting in there. I like to use the high volume and acuity part because that's what's going on to at least show that because if you get a complaint later on, like even as something as simple as complaint, not even lawsuit, but you get a complaint later on to say like, I sat there for six hours and never got a CT or it took that long or whatever. Um, the, they're not going to see all the surrounding data, including the people who are going to be telling you like, hey, there, there's this complaint on you for this. And you can say, if you look at the chart, I've, I've tried to track along what's going on in the background. So I, dis I disagree with you on that. Okay. I, I mean, honestly, I've been, I've been taught to never criticize the hospital for a variety I'm of reasons. I'm not criticizing. I'm but just saying that what's away. going on. You are in a way because if you, there could, it's like this golden ivory tower thing when you were in court. They're like, look, if you really wanted that CT done, you would have found a way to get it done. And I feel like if you look back and say, well, you know, the department was busy. The department was busy. I, I, I don't know if that would fly. I'll be right down the middle. I think there's some value in being realistic. <laughs> and I agree with you that you have to be careful not to be f pointing fingers at not only the hospital and others, but at yourself. So when you, you don't want to be documenting in a way that says, had it not been like this, I would have acted differently. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Because like the standard of care fair. is that's the fair. standard of care. Yeah, and, and I exactly. tell you, volumes and environment have only uh, anecdotally changed the outcome of some cases. It's not necessarily been known to change the standard of care to an individual patient. But I think you can say we were resource constrained. We can, you can use a general statement that kind of implies it. But you just want to be careful that you don't imply that I wish I could have handled this differently if it weren't for this. That's what it sounds like to That's, me when you say that. Well, it depends on the word choice. Words like, matter. Words matter. Like you escalated this issue to the charge nurse and the charge nurse said the patient has to continue to wait. Well, that I wouldn't do. Yeah, so that's frequently documented. I mean, I've seen that many times. I mean, again, blaming people or the hospital or the situation, yeah. to me, that's what it is. But I think checking, like. you know, check to a CT um, on two occasions to make sure that the patient can have the most available, can, can, is moving through the system as quickly that as possible. That sounds a little better. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to be proactive to make sure your patient is getting the care that they need uh, without without an opinion about why it might not be happening. I, I did mean, not get to take a lunch yet, and I am writing this because fair. I am trying to, you yeah. know, it's like... I, I have not taken a bathroom break, and I would like the staff to hold me up like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. And the same and goes tap me far. in the super pubic area. <laughs> yes. Only at a certain rate, Entertainment though. for everyone. Yes. Must be fast enough for it to work. Fast enough, and it's not going to... That's gonna, something you only do on Friday. It's not nice. going to take me five minutes. <laughs> I got to go. And the period <laughs> right on that now. one is going to be... The same goes when you're waiting a consultant to call back. You don't have to say, I don't know what's going on with orthopedics these days, but all right, I, I called again. You know, you can just be matter of fact, yep. call orthopedics at Second this page. time. Second page. Second page. Call the orthopedics yep. at this time. Fifth page. Stick, with, stick like, with the facts. I mean, yeah, like you don't have to go to second, third, fourth, fifth. Like someone can look and go, page. wow, like they, they noted it well, multiple times. Well, and to your point earlier, I mean, there are some really good reasons why this patient actually is waiting for their CT. Yeah. You know, if you had three strokes and you had a, a thoracic aortic dissection and you... They're in the right order, so it's not even, you know... They, but do you include that in there? No, but I'm just See, saying... See, that's what I think. It's like, you've you got to be careful I, about I, what you No, doing. exactly, and, and so that's why I think you can just state that, you know, if we've checked and, and patient is appropriately prioritized and we'll get their CT, but you've checked in. And to your, I think the most important point out of the great points that you made was that you're not just letting six hours go by and there's no documentation from you, that you're doing what you can. You're not responsible for everything, but you've got to show that you've leaned in and tried to help. I've checked. The patient is stable. Checked in on their status for CT, um, you know, and, and I think it's, it reflects a thoughtful approach. That's all you can do. You can't control everything. I think this is a great discussion. The time is now 5.20, and I wanted to honor what I said. Um, we're going to wrap it up with the panel for now. There's a lot of interesting discussion to be had, though, about these issues when it comes to um, how do you document return to ED instructions? How do you word your MDM? 
We've talked about it on the two view a bit. Literally, Chip and Kevin have talked about it on Totally EM previously. And so I'd advise you, go find those discussions. Yeah. And also, like, we're still here till tomorrow. Like, come hit us up, you know, off to the side. We'll talk more. We'll wrap with you. It's cool. Wait, you should... are coming back, right? <laughs> we should give us. Let's check real quick. You come back, yeah. please. <laughs> Risk Management Monthly is. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, Rick and Kevin, it's really, it's wonderful. So I, fun. I just listened to the last one that you did with, um, Je it was Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she had been on the show previously to talk about medical legal issues and really, this is the kind of expert opinion that people pay hundreds of dollars to get. So do a preemptive learning and, and get some of this information when you can. I mean, and Risk Management Monthly, awesome. We have other things. These people have experience. You know, they've been in, in, in when was the last time you were in a courtroom, by the way? Last time I was in a courtroom was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay, well. That's that's actually good. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the right answer. Oh, risk management. Uh, every time I've been in a courtroom, it has never been to defend myself. I will just that, say that yes, much. Yeah. That's good. Risk Management Monthly is one of the podcasts in the CCME for us. Uh, CCME.org galaxy. Um, mm -hmm. It is, you know, several physicians opining specifically on medical legal issues. It's yeah. focused fully on that. It comes out every month, give or take. And it is available, you know, uh, you, I think you get CME as well for it. Yeah, you do. Yeah, so, yeah. so there you go. And there's, right. there's random plucky comic relief, too. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's entertaining. Something yeah. for everyone, I hope. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us for the panel. Again, please look for tomorrow morning's start time. You want to make sure you're here on time. We're starting a little bit earlier to respect flights and such like that. We're going to do a quick reset and then begin our brief episode of The Two View, where, again, we're giving away a full course. Don't want to miss it. Thanks for being here.